Hello, busy bookworms. I am coming back with chapter 32 of Redeeming Love Today by Francine Rivers. We only have three more chapters of this book. I'm always kind of sad when I finish this one because it's so good. All right, chapter 32. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. William Cowper. Miriam watched Paul brood over his supper. He had hardly eaten a bite of his stew, and his mug of coffee was cold. She didn't even need to ask what was wrong. You've been to see Michael. Yes, he said bleakly. He pushed his plate back, a frown darkening his face. I don't understand him anymore. I don't understand him at all. Miriam waited, hoping he would say more that this time he would explain. He was angry and frustrated, but something more was praying at him, something deep and unseen, something crippling, a cancer of the soul. Paul spoke through gritted teeth. When's he going to give up? It tears at my guts to see him on his knees over that woman. He let out his breath sharply. Miriam, I wanted to hit him. He clenched his fist. I wanted to shake him. He was praying when I got there, down on his knees in the barn, praying for her. She couldn't understand his animosity. But why shouldn't he, Paul? She's his wife, and he still loves her. His face set in hard lines. A wife? Can't you see what she's done to him? She told me she was leaving because she thought it best for him. He scraped his chair back abruptly. Do you believe that? You never knew her, not really. She was cold as steel, Miriam. She was a prostitute, a paradise. She never had any feelings for Michael, other than feelings of convenience. Not in the beginning and not in the end. She hasn't got a heart. Don't be such a fool. Miriam's eyes welled at his attack. She had, he's, she had seen her father get angry many times, but he had never lashed out against those who loved him. She couldn't keep silent. You're the one who never knew her, Paul. You never even tried. Don't defend her to me. I knew her, he said harshly. I knew her better than you or Michael. You both saw what you wanted to see. I saw what she really was. Miriam lifted her head. She wasn't going to sit silent while he violated her friend. You saw Amanda as some vile creature that wasn't even worthy of your slightest courtesy. His face grew livid. Are you reprimanding me for not falling under her spell like the rest of you in my own house? Miriam's lips parted. He might as well have put a sword through her heart. Oh. Then it's only your home now. Even though we're married, she said in a constricted voice, I'm just a guest until you decide to cast me out. God help me if I do anything wrong, if I prove to be fallible. Paul regretted his words even before she began speaking. Miriam, I didn't. Her own anger was growing swiftly. I suppose I've no rights in my thoughts or beliefs if they're contrary to your own. Is that it, Paul? She stood and pointed to the door. If I want to speak my mind, I have to go outside to do it? Or better yet, be sure I'm on the other side of your boundary line? Guilt killed his remorse. Her words struck at his conscience, and he lashed out again in defense. You know that's not what I meant. When she started to cry, he wilted. Miriam, don't, he groaned. I don't know what you mean anymore, Paul. You're eaten up with bitterness. You carry your hatred like a banner, waving it all the time. You won't say what it was Amanda did to you to make you hate her. So it makes me wonder if you weren't a party to it. Paul could feel the heat coming up into his face and his temper rising with it. He started to defend himself, but Miriam wasn't finished. I would have never have come to you the way I did, if not for Amanda. What are you talking about? Her voice dropped. 
I wouldn't have had the courage. She could see he didn't understand and she couldn't explain. Her throat was closed tight with pain and she just wanted to sit down and put her head in her hands. Even if she could tell him, he would never listen. He was deaf to anything that had to do with the goodness in Amanda. Her face was crumpling like a hurt child's, and he felt his insides twisting tight in pain. I love you, he said hoarsely. Miriam, I love you. You don't act like it. <sighs> Angel got between Michael and me. Don't let her come between us, too. You put her there. No, I did it he said fiercely. Can't you see what she does? He wanted to beg her to listen. He couldn't bear the look on her face. She's broken, Michael, he said, his voice cracking. Michael's stronger now than he ever was. That's why he's on his knees. He's fighting for her, the only way he can. Miriam, she got her hooks into him and then ripped him to pieces. Are you really that blind? Michael's the one who tore through all her defenses. She loves him. If that were the truth, wouldn't she have stayed? Nothing could have driven her away, but she didn't stay, did she? She left him just like that. He snapped his fingers. And here you are, trying to tell me she has a heart. Miriam sat down heavily and looked up at her husband's embittered face. Had she really thought to save him by herself? What arrogance. He was further from her now than if he had gone back to the mountains to look for gold. All she knew was what she felt. I love her too, Paul. As much as any one of my own flesh and blood sisters. Whatever you think of her. I know her, and I'm going to pray every day of my life that she comes back. Paul slammed the door as he stormed out. Angel lay in bed, staring up at the ceiling. She knew she had done the right thing, but sometimes her longing for Michael became so intense it was physical pain. Was he well? Was he happy? Surely he would have given up on her by now. He would have come to realize that they were never meant to be together. She knew he would never forgive her. But he could go on with his life. He would have Miriam. He could have children. She couldn't let herself dwell on it. If she did, she would drown in self-pity. It was over, finished, behind her. She had to go on. She closed her eyes, pushing the pain down. She rose and dressed, thinking over the wonderful things that had happened. Cherry was settled with a couple who owned a bakery. She was happy and adapting to her new life. Little Faith had been adopted by a Baptist family and was now living in Monterey with her new brothers and sisters. And she was learning to read and write, for letters had come. As much as Angel loved living with the Axles, she knew she couldn't remain with them forever. They had been far too kind already, providing her with shelter, protection, and friendship. They had even seen to a new wardrobe for her. Given the choice of what she wanted, she had asked for dove gray and brown wool in simple styles. Susanna was the one who insisted on tutoring her. Angel despaired of learning what Susanna laid out, but her new friend insisted. You're quick, and it'll come to you. Don't expect so much of yourself so soon. The lessons were hard, and Angel wondered if the effort would be worth the labor. She thought about going back to work for Virgil, then dismissed it. Somehow, she knew that wasn't what she was intended to do, but what was? Susanna took her along when she did the buying for the family. They wandered through the markets purchasing meat, vegetables, bread, and sundry items. Angel learned to bargain. It wasn't much different from selling pans to miners. She knew how to bluff. She knew how to pretend indifference, and she usually got what Susanna wanted for rock-bottom price. <sighs> One look into your baby blue eyes, and they practically hand over their goods for free. They fall all over themselves to serve you, Susanna laughed. And imagine getting a proposal at the market. It wasn't a proposal, Susanna. It was a proposition. There's a big difference. 
Well, don't look so grim. You said no, and very politely, too, I might add. Maybe if she wore sackcloth, men wouldn't notice her. Even in dove gray, men's heads turned when she passed. Few bothered her, and she suspected it was more because Susanna Axel was beside her than any credit to her new purity. The Axels were well-known and highly respected in the community. Angel wondered what would happen if she were out from beneath their protective wings. At the first sign of hardship, would she weaken again? It was a thought that made her shallow, swallow her pride and accept the Axels' continued goodwill. She even began to go to church with them, feeling insulted and protected, insulated and protected with Jonathan and Priscilla on one side and Susanna on the other. She drank in the words of salvation and redemption, though she felt she had no right to them. She was so hungry and thirsty, she panted like a deer after the water of life. Remembering as she listened to the dream she had had in Duke's Bordello in Portman Square. Oh, God. It was you speaking to me, wasn't it? It was you. And that night in the cabin so long ago when I smelled that wonderful fragrance and thought I heard someone speaking to me, it was you. Everything Michael had said to her, everything he had done made sense to her now. He had lived Christ so that she could understand. Oh, Lord, why was I so blind? Why couldn't I hear? Why did it take so much pain for me to see that you've been there, reaching out to me all along? Each Sunday following the sermon, the pastor gave an invitation to anyone wanting to receive Christ as their Savior and Lord. Each time he gave the opportunity to come forward, Angel felt her nerves tighten. The still, quiet voice beckoned tenderly. Come to me, beloved. Stand and come to me. Warmth spread over her. This was the love she'd been waiting for all her life, yet she could not move. Oh, Michael, if only you were with me today. If only you were here to walk forward with me, maybe then I'd have the courage. Each Sunday, she closed her eyes, trying to gather her nerve to answer the call, and each Sunday, she failed to do it. She sat trembling, knowing she was unworthy, knowing that after all she had said and against God, she had no right to be his child. On the fourth Sunday, Susanna leaned close and whispered, You want to go forward, don't you? You've wanted to for weeks. Eyes stinging, throat closed tight, Angel nodded once and hung her head. Her lips pressed together. She was afraid. So afraid she was shaking. What right had she to pre present herself to God and receive mercy? What right? I'll walk with you, Susanna said and took her hand firmly. It was the longest walk of Angel's life as she went down the aisle and faced the pastor waiting at the end of it. He was smiling, his eyes shining. She thought of Michael and felt a rush of anguish. Oh, Michael, I wish you were here with me now. I wish you were here to see this. Will you ever know you struck the match and brought light to my darkness? Her heart filled with gratitude. Oh, God, he loves you so. She didn't cry. She had years of practice containing her emotions, and she wouldn't give in to them now before all these people, not even with Susanna Axel at her side. She could feel the eyes of everyone in the church upon her, watching her every move, listening for any catch in her voice. She mustn't make a fool of herself. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? the pastor asked her. I believe, she said with grave dignity and closed her eyes briefly. Oh God, forgive my unbelief. Make my faith larger than a mustard seed, Jesus. Let it grow, please. And do you live, give your life to Jesus now before these witnesses? If so, would you signify by saying I do? Words meant for a wedding ceremony? A sad smile touched her lips. With Michael, she had said, Why not? rather than I do. 
She had come to the end of her endurance and felt she had no choice. She felt that now. She had come to the end of her struggles, the end of her fight to survive on her own. She needed God. She wanted him. He had brought her out of her old life when she had no faith. And now that she knew he was really there, he was holding out his hand to her and making a proposal. Oh, Michael, this is what you wanted for me, isn't it? This is what you meant when you said someday I'd have to make a choice. Angel, the pastor said, perplexed. No one breathed or moved. I do, she responded, smiling radiantly. I most assuredly do. He laughed. Turning her toward the congregation, he said, This is Angel, a new sister in Christ. Welcome her. And they did. But things couldn't stay the same. She felt that in her very soul. She wasn't meant to stay in this safe bubble, protected by the axles. Sooner or later, she was going to have to leave them and find out if she could stand on her own. First, she had to figure out what she was going to do with her life. The purchases put away in the kitchen, Angel went upstairs to her room. She took off her dark cape and hung it by the door. Priscilla had given her the bedroom cherry and Faith had shared. It was spacious, comfortably furnished, and had a fireplace in the corner. Someone had lit the fire. Angel pushed the lace curtains aside and looked out the window. The fog was rolling in, sending puffs of mist past the glass. She could see the wharf and a forest of ships deserted in the harbor. One by one, they were being stripped and sunk for a landfill. She remembered another day when she had stood in the upstairs window, watching Michael below as he drove out of paradise. She remembered hearing his voice out of the agony she had brought on herself with McGowan. She remembered Michael laughing and chasing her down in the cornfield. She remembered his compassion, his righteous rage, his tender understanding, his strength. She remembered his all-consuming love, and she knew what he would have her do to find the answer she needed. Pray. She could almost see his face as he said it. Pray. Closing her eyes, she sighed wearily. I know I've no right to ask anything of you, Lord, but Michael said I should, so I'm doing it. Jesus, if you're listening, would you please tell me where to go from here? I don't know what to do. I can't stay here forever and live off these nice people. It's not right. I have to pay my own way in this world. What do you want me to do with the rest of my life, Jesus? I've got to do something or go mad. I'm asking, Jesus. I'm begging. What do you want me to do? <sighs> Amen. She sat for more than an hour, waiting. No light from heaven came. No voice. Nothing. A few days later, Susanna came to her room after dinner. You've been very quiet all week, Angel. What's bothering you? Are you worrying about your future? Angel wasn't surprised that Susanna knew what was wrong. She seemed to anticipate people's thoughts and feelings. I, I have to do something, she said honestly. I can't stay here and live off your family for the rest of my life. You won't. It's been six months, Susanna, and I'm no closer to knowing what I should do than I was the night I came here. Have you prayed about it? Angel blushed vividly. Susanna's eyes shone and she laughed. Well, you needn't look as though you've been caught in an indiscretion. Don't look so pleased, Angel said dryly. God didn't answer. Susanna shrugged. Not yet, maybe. God always answers in his time, not in yours. You'll know what you're supposed to do when the time comes. I wish I could have your faith. You could ask for it, Susanna grinned. Angel felt a stab of pain. You remind me of Miriam. I'll take that as a compliment, Susanna's expression softened. Faith in God hasn't come easily to me either, whatever you may believe. She got up. Come on, I want to show you something. She held out her hand. They went into Susanna's bedroom where they had talked many times before. 
Susanna let go of Angel's hand and got down on the floor and ducked beneath the bedspread. She took out a box and put it on the bed. I have to get down on my knees to get it, she said, dusting off her hands as she got up. Well, I should dust under there one of these days. She tucked a loose curl of dark hair back into her bun and sat. Sit down, she said, patting the bed. Angel did as she was asked, looking curiously at the container between them. Susanna put the container in her lap. This is my god box, she said. When problems prey on my mind, I write them down, fold them up, and put them through the slot. Once they're inside this box, they're God's problems and not mine. Angel laughed. Susanna sat solemnly looking at her, and Angel's mirth died. You are joking, aren't you? No, I'm quite serious. She rested her hands on the box. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it works. I'm a fixer, Angel, a worrier. I've never been able to just let things go. I want to play God, if you will. She smiled in self-mockery. Every time I do, things go awry. She patted the box. So, I have this. A simple brown hat box, Angel said dryly. Yes, a plain, ordinary hat box, but it reminds me to put faith in God and not in myself. The bonus comes when I see my prayers answered. Her mouth twitched. I can see you think I'm out of my mind. Shall I show you? She took the, the top off. Inside were dozens of small papers neatly folded. She sifted through them and took one at random, opening it. Cherry needs a home, she read. The note was dated. I like to know how long it takes God to answer, she laughed at herself. Since this prayer's been answered, I won't put the note back in the box. She folded it and put it on the bedspread beside her and took out another note. God, give me patience with Papa. If he brings another pr prospective husband to the house, I may join a convent. And you know I'd make a very bad nun. Angel laughed with her. I'd better leave that one in the box. She took out another. She was silent for a moment before she read, Please make Faith's nightmares go away. Protect her from the evil one. She folded it and put it back in the box. Do you see what I mean? I think so, Angel said. But what if God says no? The possibility didn't distress her. Then he's got something else in mind, something better than what you would think up for yourself. She frowned and looked down at the full box. Angel, it's not always easy to accept. She closed her eyes and let her breath out slowly. I had everything planned out for myself at one time. As soon as I met Stephen, I knew exactly what I wanted and what I was going to do. He was handsome and vibrant. He was studying to be a minister, and he was full of such fire and zeal. She smiled. We were going to go west and spread the gospel to the Indians. She shook her head, her eyes filling with pain. Did he leave you? In a manner of speaking, he was killed. It was so senseless. He used to go down to the worst sections of the city and talk to men in the saloons. He said they needed God more than the others more fortunate did. He wasn't going to be a rich man's pastor. Apparently, one night, a man was being badly beaten in an alley and Stephen tried to stop it. He was stabbed to death. Her face jerked, and she bit her lip. I'm sorry, Susanna, Angel said, feeling her friend's grief as though it were her own. Susanna clenched her hand. Tears filled her eyes and slowly trickled down her pale cheeks. I blamed God. I was so angry. Why, Stephen? Why someone so good? Someone with so much to offer. I was even angry at Stephen. Why had he been a fool enough to go down to those horrible places? Why bother with those people? They'd made their choices, hadn't they? She sighed. It was all such a muddle, my emotions at war. I was no comfort. It was no comfort to me at all to know that Stephen was with the Lord. I wanted him with me. She was quiet for a long moment. I still do. Angel took her hand and squeezed it. She knew how it felt to long for someone with your whole being and know 
he would forever be out of reach. Susanna looked at her. You said you weren't sure what you were supposed to do from here. Well, we're both in the same boat. She smiled again. But it'll come, Angel. I know it will come. The top of the box slipped off the bed and she let go of Angel's hand to retrieve it. As she bent over, the box spilled notes all over the floor. Angel went down on her knees with her to help her gather them together and put them back in the box. So many slips of paper, so many prayers. Susanna picked one up and glanced at it. She sat back on her heels and smiled, the pallor leaving her cheeks and the light coming back into her eyes. Smiling, she kept it in her hand as Angel put all the others back into the box and fit the top on. Susanna slid the container back beneath the bed. Sometimes he answers quickly. Still smiling, she held the note out to Angel. Read this. Angel took it and laboriously made out the neatly scripted words. God, please, please, I need a friend I can talk to. It was dated the day before Angel came home with Jonathan. Michael loaded his wagon with bags of wheat and headed for Sacramento. There was a mill on the way where he could have the grain ground and properly stacked for market. It had been a good harvest. He would make enough to buy a few head of cattle and a couple of piglets. By next year, he'd have bacon and ham for smoking and beef to sell. He spent the night beside a stream where he and Angel had stopped. Sitting in the moonlight, looking at the pool, he was filled with thoughts of her. He could almost smell the sweet scent of her skin in the night breeze. His body tingled and grew warm. He remembered her hesitant smile and the startled look whenever he breached her considerable defenses. Sometimes it was just a word or look that did it unexpectedly, and he had felt elation during those moments, as though he, and not God, had accomplished the impossible. Lowering his head, Michael wept. Yes. He had learned he was powerless. He had learned a man can live after a woman breaks his heart. He had learned he could live without her, but, oh God, I'll miss her till I die. He would feel this ache inside himself, wondering if she was all right, if she was taking care of herself, if she was safe from harm. Reminding himself that God was watching over her too didn't help. Angel's words, Angel's own words, always came back to haunt him. Oh, I know God. Do something wrong and he'll squash you like a bug. Did she still believe that? Had his own faith and conviction been so weak that she couldn't see it? Had the cruelty she had suffered and her own powerlessness against it taught her nothing? Did she still think she had control of her life? As the tormenting thoughts built in his mind, he reached back and hung to one simple scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Sweat beaded his brow, and he clenched his hand. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He said it over and over to himself until his mind eased and his body relaxed. And then Michael prayed for Angel. Not that she would ever come back to him but that she would find God for herself. When he pulled out in the morning, he swore to himself that no matter the temptation, he wouldn't reach, search for his wife when he reached Sacramento, and he would never set foot in San Francisco. Angel! Angel! Angel's whole body jerked as someone called her name. Why had she felt the urge to come down here to the square? She should have gone home as soon as she finished visiting with Virgil. He had fired another cook and tried to talk her into coming back to work for him. She almost wished she hadn't come and raised his hopes. She'd found herself wandering along the streets again, passing a theater and a saloon, her old haunting grounds. She didn't know why she was here. She had just gone out for a walk to think things through, to try to make some plans and felt compelled to come back here. It was more than disheartening. And now... Someone from her past was pressing through the crowd and coming after her. She had the urge to run and not look back. Angel! Wait! 
Gritting her teeth, she stopped and turned around. She recognized the young woman coming toward her immediately. And seeing her again, she could feel herself straightening up and putting on the mask of disdain and calm. Hello, Tori, she said, tilting her chin slightly. Tori's eyes swept her up and down. I, I couldn't believe it was you. You look so different. She looked uncertain. Are you still married to that farmer? Angel felt the pain before she could batten it down. No, not anymore. Too bad. He was rather special. There was something about him. She shrugged. Well, that's life, I guess. She looked at Angel's doe-brown dress and cape and worried her lower lip. You aren't in the business anymore, are you? No, I haven't been for over two years. You heard about Lucky? Angel nodded. Dear, dear Lucky. My Ling was in the fire, too. I know. She wanted to cut this conversation short and go back to the big house on the hill. She didn't want to think about the past. She didn't want to look at Tori and see how she had aged. She didn't want to recognize the hopelessness in her eyes. Well, at least McGowan got what he deserved, Tori said. She stared at Angel's pristine collar. Meg's dying of the pox, she went on. The Duchess turned her out as soon as she found out. I used to see Maggie once in a while, sleeping in a doorway with a bottle of gin in her hand. She raised one shoulder. Not lately, though. Are you still with the Duchess? Tori gave a laugh. Nothing ever changes. At least for some of us. A cynical smile lingered. It's not so bad, really. She's just built a new place, and she's got a good cook. I'm doing all right. I've even got a little money laid aside for my future. Angel felt a heaviness in her chest. Was Tori pretending she was fine when she was bleeding to death inside? Tori talked on, but Angel hardly heard a word she said. She kept looking into Tori's eyes and seeing things she had never recognized before. And it all came back to her. Everything she had ever experienced from the time she was eight years old. The pain and the loneliness of it. And it was there, in Tori's eyes, too. Well, I've kept you long enough talking about the good old times, Tori said, smiling bleakly. I'd better get back to work. One more today, and I'm, then I can relax. As she started to turn away, Angel felt the strangest rush within her. Warmth filled her, and then a burst of energy and assurance such as she had never experienced before. She reached out quickly and stopped Tori. Have lunch with me, she said, so excited she was trembling. Me? Tori was as surprised as Angel. Yes, you, Angel said, smiling. She felt as though she would burst with the ideas expanding inside her. She knew! She knew what God wanted her to do. She knew exactly what he wanted. I know just a little cafe around the corner. She looped her arm through Tori's and drew her along. The proprietor's name is Virgil. You'll like him. And I know he's going to be pleased to meet you. Tori was too stunned to protest. Did she say where she was going? Jonathan asked his distraught daughter. No, father, you know how restless she's been these past weeks. This morning she said she was going out for a walk. She wanted to go alone to think. She hasn't been back since. I think something's happened to her. You don't know that at all, Priscilla said. You're letting your emotions take over. Angel knows how to take care of herself. Your mother's right, Jonathan agreed. But he couldn't help but wonder. If Angel wasn't home in another hour, he would take the carriage out and go looking for her. Susanna stopped her pacing long enough to peer out the curtain. It's getting dark. Oh, oh, there she is. She's coming up the hill. She swung around, eyes blazing. She smiled and waved. She swished the lace curtains closed and marched toward the foyer. I'm going to tell her what I think of her worrying us half sick. Angel burst into the house and hugged Susanna before she could utter a word of reprimand. Oh, Susanna, you won't believe it. You just won't. Angel laughed. Well, 
I take that back. You would believe it. She shook her cape out and hung it up, tossing her bonnet on top with a careless air. Jonathan noticed the difference in her immediately. Her face was aglow, and the smile she wore was one of joy. I know what God wants me to do with my life, she said, sitting on the edge of the sofa. She clasped her hands on her knees and looked as though she was going to burst with excitement. He watched his daughter sit down slowly nearby. She looked as though she was losing her best friend. Well, maybe she was. I'm going to need your help, Angel said to Jonathan. I'll never be able to repay what you've done already, but I'm going to ask you for more. She shook her head. I'm going too fast. First, I have to tell you what happened today. She told them about meeting Tori and lunching with her. She told them of the young prostitute's dejection and hopelessness and how she had felt the same way for so many years. She could have had a job with Virgil if she had known how to cook. As it is, he was kind enough to let her stay if I'd go down and work with her for the next few weeks until she knows what to do. She's quick. She'll be able to handle things on her own in no time. You're losing us, Jonathan said. The girl was so excited that she was making little sense. Tori said if she could find a way out, she'd take it. Virgil asked if she could cook, and she said no. And it came to me right there in Virgil's, why not? Why not what? Susanna said, exasperated. You're making no sense. Why not give her a way out? Angel said. Teach her to cook. Teach her to sew. Teach her to make hats. Teach her anything that would give her another way to make a living. Jonathan, I want to buy a house where someone like Tori can come and be safe and learn to earn her own living without selling her body to do it. Jonathan grew thoughtful. I have some friends who might help. How much money do you think you'll need to get started? There's a house a couple blocks from the docks. She told him how much it was. His brows rose. It was a great deal of money. He glanced at Priscilla, but she gave him no help. Another look at Angel, and he knew he couldn't say no, and blot out the look of hope and purpose in her eyes. We'll see to it tomorrow morning. Eyes shining, she bent and kissed his cheek. Thank you, dear friend. Father has other friends who help support the house, Susanna said. Jonathan glanced at his daughter and saw the change in her expression. He hadn't seen that sparkle since Stephen died. His chest tightened. Oh, God. The sudden insight hurt. I'm going to lose her after all. Not to a wild young zealot who intends to take her off into the wilderness and convert the heathen Indians, but to Angel and others like her. He wanted his girl married and settled with children of her own. He wanted her in a house close by so she could come visit frequently. He wanted her to be more like Priscilla and less like himself. He watched Susanna pace back and forth, plans gushing forth like a fountain. Angel was laughing and tossing in her own ideas, one on top of the other. They were both so beautiful it was hard to look at them. Light shining in the darkness. Jonathan closed his eyes. Oh, God, it's not the way I had things planned. But then, what of real lasting value ever is?